Well, good evening, everyone. It's a great pleasure to uh, welcome our speaker for tonight, our colleague, Dr. Matthew Zacharias, who's a retired anaesthetist uh, working until very recently in Dunedin Hospital and the Dunedin School of Medicine. And Matthew is very well placed and very experienced in the topic that he has tonight, chemical weapons. He's got first-hand experience of managing such things. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Matthew. Thank you. Hi. Can you guys hear me? OK, I've got a funny accent. You may have to put up with that. But I've written more things in the slide. Now, this presentation is going to be something like an RBL type of preparation. Abiel is a South Indian vegetarian dish. If you, if you get it right, it takes exquisite. But if the mixing of the various spices and vegetables and oils, if you don't get it right, it is absolute rubbish, like the proverbial shit. Um, so I'll try and mix everything together and make it into a preparation. A lot of it is research into history. And some of it is my own experience. Now, I like art. Um, those of you who have been to Imperial War Museum seen this one by John Sargent. This is describing or showing the soldiers who are dead or dying or who have been gassed during the First World War. There is another impressive one by Picasso showing the agony and frustration and anger and helplessness of the people in Spain during the bombing. Now, war is a, there are a few problems with the war. I've seen enough of it. So I can probably say it honestly, I hate war. This is a, for this photograph is a Palestinian girl a couple of years ago who shows without making any caption, you saw the desperation, the agony, the helplessness, and the fact that, and she is absolutely scared shit. That is the problem in war, it affects common people. They become very depressed. They are anxious, they are desperate, and can't do anything about it. And on top of it, there is always rumor mills. This particular statement, first casualty of war is truth is by uh, Senator Johnson in, uh, during the First World War. It's actually quite true. You hear a lot of lies, a lot of propaganda, a lot of exaggeration, a lot of ignorance. So it, you have to always go through this um, to understand what really happened or what is happening. Now, this presentation is inspired by one of my heroes, Spike Milligan. He wrote a book called Adolf Hester, My Part in His Downfall. In fact, beggar all, he had no part in it. He was in the army, but never fired a shot in anger, made a mess of his life there and annoyed everybody else. Visited almost every brothel in Europe and kicked out of half of them. But he claimed he has a part in the downfall of his Hitler. So probably, that's probably a type of presentation I'm going to give you. And of course, the other place, my colleague and alternative theorist, David, he always looks for the truth because I, I, like him, I believe there is always an alternative truth to any fact. Why am I talking about war and weapons? I always liked story, war stories. In school, for example, about five or six years, we had paramilitary training. It's just like the army training. We had uh, the use of weapons, theory of war, route marches, camps, map reading, all these kind of things army people do, except we never shot anybody in anger. But we could practice our rifles. Damn, I was very good at it, actually. Soon after graduation, because of the liking for the army, I joined the Indian Armed Forces as a lieutenant. That was my name, Lieutenant Mundrakal. That's my family name. 
it lasted exactly one week because I had a massive hepatitis A and I nearly died. So I, my father took me home and I decided to become an anesthetist. So the best, the next best thing is I joined as a civilian anesthetist for the New Zealand Defence Forces. That's the proof, me in uh, Suwai, which is East Timor. So the plan of attack is I describe some of the weapons of war, some of the chemical weapons, some of the modern conflicts and modern chemical attacks. If you look at the weapons of war, the war used to be fun in the old days, in the in 1200 BC, um, uh, for the, during the Trojan War. They had a good breakfast, started the war at nine o'clock, stopped everything at five o'clock and went and had a shower and had a good sleep. And during the time they fought it, the honest war. The spears, arrows, stones, swords, horses, cheating, all kinds of things. But those days are gone. Wars have become very extensive, a lot of cunning things. Cannons, they, you look at the, some, of the, um, some of the things they use in the wars. Cannons was first used in 1260 during the, um, war, uh, the, during the Al Jalud War. If you look at the history of Middle East, the, the Mongol, Mongol Hulayat Khan came down to the uh, Levant and uh, da destroyed Damascus, destroyed uh, homes, destroyed um, Aleppo, destroyed Baghdad, burned down everything. But Babri Mamluk, who was the Sultan in Egypt, caught him at a place called Angelut. And because of the fact that he was able to defeat him, Islam was established, was able to be established in the Levant, which is countries on the east of the Mediterranean, as well as in the Middle East. Um, another interesting war like that was the, uh, a similar war where the Moors were defeated by El Cid um, in the in, uh, in, uh, ba Battle of Valencia 200 years ago. These two wars were probably the only wars of any significance in that age, in that era. One established the Muslim religion in the Middle East, other maintained the Christianity in, the, in Europe. That's my simple view. Rifles were used first, the French War in 1500s, they're called the Battle of Giants. Basically, they're fight, fighting each other, saying that mine is bigger than yours kind of war. It has no particular consequence. Airplanes were used by Italians first against the Turks in 1911, but in World War I, they were used by everybody. Tanks were used first 1916 by the British in Battle of Somme, and they donated four tanks to the New Zealand regiment, and two of them were lost by the evening. The first modern war was actually the Crimean War, Russia versus the the rest of them, all for no particular reason, and Russia was beaten. But that war is important in that that's the first time uh, the war things were produced in large amounts. Weapons were produced in mass group, like rifles, shells, mines, assault ships. So there's much more organized war. And the, way, the proper field hospitals were established and field ambulance services, even though pulled by horses, they were established in that particular war. And the field nursing and surgery again was established. That's the era of Florence Nightingale, proper hygiene, care of care and compassion of the, the people who were admitted there, and some kind of order and coordination between the front, uh, front the war front and the hierarchy, IRM. So it was a pretty well organized war. So following that, they have the Hague Convention, they establish rules of war, and like establish the laws and customs of war in the strict sense, by defining the rules that the belligerents must follow during hostilities. And one of the key points in that was no poisons. This is what everybody thought about that. History of wars are too broad. So I looked at, uh, look at the topic in the World War, 
one, then chemical weapons, then concentrated on New Zealand expeditionary forces. And the source, quite a lot of surface, particularly the paper, papers of the past. Now, National Library has got a website. You can read any newspaper in New Zealand dating back as much as you as much as much as you want to go. It is very good site. Then even public library has got a lot of gussets. They are huge big documents with 2,000, 3,000 pages. There is theses, books. Hawken Library is a very good source. And I managed to get uh, some books, New Zealand Wars, with them through hell. That's about uh, medical things. History of New Zealand chemical warfare during the um, during various wars. Casualties, that is by tag of witness. And uh, Roll of Honor. And of course, this is probably one of the best books uh, I read, History of Medical Service in the Great War. Why am I interested in chemical weapons? I have worked in multiple conflict zones. As a doctor, I'll come to it uh, some stage in, in the lecture. And I personally got, at, uh, got had exposure to chemical weapons. I'll come to it again later. And I have treated victims of chemical weapon attacks not so long ago. The chemical or biological weapons now, biological weapons are never used in large scale in any war. But having said that, almost every large country has got lots of them, uh, viruses or bacteria. They're all waiting for the other side to use it first because they, everybody knows the, the, the terrible tragedy it can bring on. Chemical weapons have been used in World War I, of course. Uh, there was a chemical weapon convention in 1993. Everybody is, almost everybody, every country is a member. Um, but in spite of that, chemical weapons are produced by every country and everybody knows that. And some of them can be made by in the, in the lab. I'm discussing chemical weapons and nothing else. List of chemical weapons, there are nerve no agents, they are very, very powerful. G agents like taboo, sarin, soman. Then V agents, extremely toxic, VX. I don't think it's easy to make them. Only certain governments, certain countries make it. Then there is a blistering agent like mustard gas or yellow cross gas. The ones with, with the coloration, I'm going to talk about it later. So then systemic agents like cyanide, arsine, or call it blue cross gas. Then choking agents, chlorine, phosgene, diphosgene. Then right control things, uh, CNCS, I'll talk about it, or otherwise known as tear gas. Then dioxin or agent orange. Chemical weapon, the first history is that they use in Peloponnesian War in 479 BC. Uh, if you look at uh, that part of the world, there is a lot of sulfur available because there were a lot of volcanic uh, stuff around there. So Spartans used against Athenians and they won the war, but it has nothing to do with the uh, fact that they send sulfur fumes. But uh, first successful use of sulfur fumes was the Persians against Romans and Dura in Syria. I killed a few Romans, but that's it. The first use of chemical agents in various countries in wars is, UK used it first during the Boer War, but it was shells containing picric acid. It didn't do much harm to anybody. France used tear gas first in 1914, and German used chlorine first in 1915. USA, as far as the reading goes, took a moral high ground. They never used it during First World War. But having said that, there is a, if you look at the ODT in 1918, um, that particular date, poison gas for use by Americans. Government is building two gigantic poison gas plants for use by the Americans on the Western Front. I don't know what they did with that. Probably sold it to the highest bidder. History of modern war, look at it. Uh, the three 
major step to use was chlorine, phosgene, and mustard gas. This picture appears everywhere. The reason is that once you get these things into your eye, you can't see anything. So they kind of hold behind one and walk along. It is pretty tragic if you look at it. Chlorine manufactured commercially, of course, uh, it has got distinct smell, immediate effect, irritates eye and nose, throat, lungs, prolonged exposure can kill, but generally effect comes on pretty quickly and doesn't last very long. In 1915, April, in April, Germans used 5,000 gas cylinders, about 150 tons of it in the April, and it killed 1,100 Britishers. Britain in turn used it in 1915, September. Unfortunately, when they sent the gas there, the wind changed and it came back. And, and there were 2,000 British soldiers affected in that particular one. That if there is something called self goal or pissing against the wind, that is what it is. Um, uh, to see how what chlorine explore, uh, exploration is, um, this is, this is I, I got recently from Potabakova in the Middle East. Somebody was lowering the a, a big container of chlorine and it kind of came off the, the rope and it produced massive explosion and killed a lot of people. 12 people killed and injured 260. And again, uh, oh, this is an, uh, interesting. In New Zealand Medical Journal, there's an article in 1983 by some people from here, Wayne Temple and Trevor Dobinson, I don't know who Dr. Edwards is. It is acute chlorine poisoning in a high school experiment. During class experiment in Dunedin School, students were asked to sniff and identify chlorine. Uh, two, 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 two of them, one girl and a boy got got into trouble when they sniffed it. Probably they breathed deep. And they had they had they were admitted to ICU, had respiratory problem, probably cardiac symptoms, persist for at least a day. So there is a moral to that particular story. If you mix bleach and acid, don't sniff it. And never ever make anybody else sniff it. New Zealand Expeditionary, Expeditionary Forces um, Turk, Turks, Turkish army sent down some sort of gas when they were in, in Gallipoli, but Anzac ignored it because they know that wind was going to West Turkey, so they couldn't be bothered. But then there is Western Front where all the attack was, so they they had all the the currently uh, currently available protective gear for them. First was cotton pad respirators, essentially. Uh, a thick bunch of cotton stuck on the face. Uh, and of course, pH helmet, finite helmets, they kind of cover the face with that. But the problem with that, it got so hot, many of them had burns around the eye. These were the definitive items which served a lot of New Zealanders and, and the people fighting the war, first of all. Gas masks with carbon filters called small box respirators. They were very effective. Um, uh, showing various types of things. The first number one there was German civil mask, then the gas mask for the armies of UK and USA, then helmets for the same. British mask for the civilians is lying on the corner here. It, um, and uh, the German soldiers were the number five there. But all of them had asbestos, asbestos in it. They had built a lot of asbestos in it, but nothing seemed to have happened. Fourth gene, if you look at the fourth gene, 85% of the deaths due to gas happened uh, during World War I happened due to fourth gene. Oh, his cousin. Um, German used it first, but and became a primary weapon for both parties. Basically, benzene hychloride or similar chemical high temperature produces force gene. And like any other gas, you lower the temperature and compress it, it becomes liquid. 
so they can store it and release it as you want. It's a greenish white liquid. I never seen it. Uh, no smell or moldy. Uh, much more deadlier than chlorine. Um, this is uh, showing an attack of force gene. Symptoms unfortunately last is, comes on late. Initially, there is some problem with the eyes and burning eye, watering eye, blurred vision some difficulty to breathe and shortness of breath, but then the problem starts after 24, 48 hours, severe pulmonary edema. And that is what killed a lot of people. You can protect yourself by wearing the gas mask. So, so they had this small box of respirators. Mustard gas, they call it king of battle gases. Uh, yellow brown liquid. It is a liquid, not a gas, so, but uh, you can send it as a droplet or a mist. It is pretty dangerous stuff. Difficult to manufacture. So when somebody says modern um, groups like uh, this and that, use this one. I don't believe that. It's not easy to make it. German used it first, then the allies. Intense itching of the skin skin irritation, they form large blisters. It eat away the skin and the rest of the part of the body. If you inhale it, you get blisters in the throat and severe pulmonary edema. This is uh, some, a photo of somebody who had an uh, attack. And 12th July 1917 was the New Zealand day suffered quite a lot. 12% was the casualty in that one. Then, other, then there's a glucose gas, or arsine. It's a simple arsenic compound, basically, but it, it's a very toxic gas if you inhale it. Not only respiratory effect, but it can have a general toxicity. It was used for on New Zealand soldiers on the September 11th, 1918, um, at Yatras. Um, it's called dichlor, arsine. Um, uh, it didn't affect too many people because they had protective gear. Three officers and uh, 127 other ranks were affected that particular day. Serious attacks, foreseen serious attack was February 17 in Solms. No, they, they thought it was okay, but um, there was not much problem for a few hours. Then they started having cyanosis, restless, dyspnea, collapse and death. In their desperation, they try to give oxygen this simple mask in birth. Camphor is just a stimulant, like uh, they give uh, um, to the boxes or, or, or people who do weightlifting, uh, they get ammonia smells like, like that. Atropine is of no use either. Um, the 25% of the New Zealand casualties are due to this one. Protective clothing, of course, is most useful. Mustard gas, uh, July 70 in the Labas. Luckily, they had better protection and awareness, so they were quite okay, except few casualties. New Zealand medics, they had uh, quite a nice setup there. They are the great nurses. They are the young and handsome looking medics. And uh, this is what we had in Subai um, in, uh, in uh, East Timor. It's not much different, probably kind of more mixed together, better uniform color. Death of soldiers, uh, a huge number of people died in First World War. This is total death. If you look at it, the Russians are outlive everybody else's. Uh, New Zealand had 18,000 deaths. Germans also had quite a few. New Zealand uh, had 18,000 old deaths and wounded, wounded by about 41%. So that was quite a lot. This is hospital admission of New Zealand and different forces from, uh, and also expedited forces from July 17 to June 18. If you look at it, you can see that gas poisoning and gas burns were there as a reasonable number. 
in a, a wounded discourse on the left side of it. But what is striking in this, this column, sexually transmitted disease as a cause of admission to the hospital. Um, it is, it is that actually made this lady, Bronwyn, write this monograph, come back with honor, prostitution and then insulin soldier at home and abroad. The common cause was gonorrhea. And if you are a man and if you read the treatment, you will cringe. They used to wash the urethra three times a day with dilute phenol. Think about it. Death due to diseases, the few diseases, lots of them, but common was influenza, meningitis, pneumonia, TB, typhoid, common things. Remember, we didn't have any antibiotics in those days. New Zealand attitude towards chemical weapons, they don't seem to have bothered much. Maybe Kiwi stoicism, reticence. Um, I'll tell you a story. I read the story. Uh, one, one night there was this attack, or rather many nights the attacks came. They just put their clothes on and slept through them, attacks. So they were not particularly worried about it. They were a different kind of population who went to the war in World War I. This joker, uh, sorry, sorry, uh, I shouldn't say that. This gentleman came back with, with lo he lost both legs. He's from, he was from Christchurch. He was polishing boots for the rest of his natural life somewhere in Christchurch. Shows how dignified they were in their jobs and how good they were in dealing with adversities. And this is a statement by one of the New Zealand soldiers. I had forced gene myself. Anyone who uses gas does not get my vote. That's honest. It is bad enough young men getting bashed and losing limbs. There are better ways of killing men than gassing them and making a mess of them because all the tender parts of the body are eaten away with the mustard gas. It's quite true. Uh, okay, this is the, the terms of the various agents used. Germany used quite a lot, Britain not that much. There are 91,000 soldiers died in First World War attributed to chemical weapons, 85% due to forced gene or died forced gene. Otago Bay soldiers who died, total death was 2,283 due to gas only 11, less than 0.5%. On the field death was only eight. They did remarkably well. The reason is they came to the Western Front when they had all this protective gear available to them, unlike the first batch of British years of one day. The worst, of course, for Otago soldiers was 100 of them died at Passchendaele on that particular day. Of the 2,700 New Zealand soldiers killed or wounded in four hours. Worst day for New Zealand in the war. The, uh, the ODT, again, if you caught it, I was looking to see whether they mentioned anything about this catastrophe in the next few days, but they didn't really. You got things like saying um, successful British raids. And then this took my attention. Um, they pleaded, one of the colonels pleaded for. Um, some additional help, the uh, brigadier said, oh boy, if I don't remember the story of Gallipoli, you fought well. So that says the command structure. Oh, I will describe one person uh, in, in, uh, about, uh, who had a few bits and pieces written about him. It was William Shaw, born in 18, uh, 1894, he's from Harley eldest of 11 children. 1915, he joined the Canterbury Mounted Rifle. 
November, he went to, uh, he went, but in, when he reached Suez, so he had appendicitis. Then he went to France, he got influenza. Then in Battle of Somme, he got cancer wound. 1917, he actually survived Jeffrey and Passion Dale. He was lucky. In, in 1918, he had foreseen gas attack. And if you read uh, the, the note in uh, Timuru Haral that particular day, he says uh, that is a letter which came to his father. Uh, Mr. W. Shaw, High Street Timuru, had received advice that his son William Murray Shaw was admitted to hospital in France on February 20th, severely gassed. Private William Shaw was previously wounded and returned to the firing line. And quite accurate. He continued, I will continue with this story. And then in 1918, April, he had tonsillitis admitted again. Then they decided to repar rep repatriate all this about 4,000, because war was winding down. 4,600 kiwis, yeah, they were in a camp in UK, but they rioted. What else you expect a Kiwi young man to do? Um, and they raided the officer's mess. One thing in army is there is a clear distinction between officers and the other ranks. You never ever raid an officer's mess and drink their whiskey or brandy or claret. And never ever eat their champagne, ham or caviar. They did all that, so they all got punished. They were asked to make the Billford Kiwi in Limestone Hills in Wilshire. In 70s, I drove to there and I didn't recognize, I, I didn't know what it was. I've never seen anything like that. I thought it was some sort of mythical bird. Now it comes to me that it was actually a Kiwi as a punishment given to them. Then he returned in, in, in 1919 February and went to farming. Then he joined New Zealand Defense Forces in World War II and he survived. He died in Christchurch Hospital in 1978. My hats off to Private William Shaw, one of the many great but forgotten Kiwis serving the country. These are the tags you use it to put on your toes when you are in the mortuary or take it and give it to your relations, confirming the death. In my in the summary about Burla, one, in spite of the officers, Britain won the war, thanks to the bravery of the soldiers. I believe every bit in this Black Order series. Kind of upper class, pompous idiots were the officers. Sorry, my language. Chemical, now moving to the chemical attack in modern times. Mustard gas was the main chemical agent used in Iran Iraq war. They used quite a lot of it. The worst uh, attack after that was in 1988. Saddam and his army used mustard gas and sarin against Kurdish civilians in a place called Hadabja in Kurdistan, northern Iraq. 5,000 people dead in that women and children mostly. This is a tragic photo that even if you can see a um, lot of statues around many parts of the world, exactly that. Somebody guarding a, a girl there. And if you go to um, um, Erbil, Erbil is the capital of um, the, the Kurdish state or Kurdistan. If you go there on March, I happen to be there on two March, two, two times on March 16th, you can see entire streets lined up with the beds from dawn till dusk, people lining up in sympathy for this particular, this group of people who died. They don't do anything, they don't say anything, they stand there without eating or drinking, just rain or sunshine. That shows their greed. 
Agent Orange was used in Vietnam War. It's a very powerful herbicide. Used 13 million tons were used in Vietnam. You say declared though dioxin is not a biological or chemical agent, but a herbicide only for defoliation. Every country agreed with that. But the Vietnamese and some of the US veterans are still suffering, including one of, one of my colleagues who worked in this hospital, who flew the Hui helicopter with this rubbish. Popal tragedy, this is not poison gas, but I need to mention it. Uh, methyl isocyanate, well, there were nearly 4,000 people dead and nearly 55,000 people injured. Um, what in, what, the reason I'm raising is that um, the after effect lasted very long. In, in, uh, people, a lot of people died the same day or next day, but it lasted many years. Union Carbide ignored the repeated warnings for two years. USA court did not hear the case, so it was heard in Indian court. Chairman Anderson or the, um, the Union Carbide got two year jail term and $2,000 fine in an Indian court. And he went in a special chartered plane. Two days later, he was released. I paid a compensation of 4,070 4, million, which practically nothing has reached the people who suffered or their families. I mean, I'm particularly sore about this because my sister-in-law was at, the, at that in Bhopal on the same day. Luckily, the wind was in the opposite direction, but it didn't kill her. But three years, three, four years later, both her and her daughter died of acute leukemia. It has to be something linked there. Facts from the war are high, uh, war fund are highly modified. For example, you have read about, uh, oh, some of you might have heard about this uh, story um, about when Iraq attacked Kuwait. Uh, a doctor made a statement saying they helped bury more than 50 premature babies in Kuwait, which turned out to be false later. But everybody believed because there was a story. And I particularly was interested in that. The, back home in India, there is a nurse who, who is next door to mine. She worked there at that time. I asked her, is that true? She said, no. But she couldn't understand why a lot of people came and throw out all the baby cots and all the baby mannequins in the road and taken all the photos and walked away. Um, so there is a lot of propaganda in the war. This everybody knows it, I'm going to describe it. That vial is infamous. This is actually from Aleppo. Uh, let me say some conflict of interest in why I'm interested in Aleppo. I belong to the Syrian Christian church in South India. The story is that St. Thomas came in and came and baptized my forefathers in 64 AD, just a couple of dozen households, but there are 25 million of us now. We are all over the world. So, and, and one group of that Christian church now gets the pontificate or the, or the patriarch from Aleppo. Whenever the old one dies, they get it from there. Um, so that was around the time when the old man died and they were looking for the new one. Um, so I was interested in what is happening in Aleppo. And I watched this video and saw that was terrible. The story was the, um, the um, government forces did that. But I watched a few channels and then one channel, they showed the TV another five more extra minutes. And then in that, they showed that, oh, we can all go. Somebody said, and they all got up, got up and walked. Either that is a false additional add to the video, or it is totally false. Who God alone knows what it is true. But that is a problem in war zones. A lot of lies, a lot of false information. Now, uh, coming to Iraq, because I worked there a few times. 
Um, ISIL or Daesh, they call it, killed a lot of people who did not believe in their ideology. Most of the minorities left Christians, Yazidis, Assyrians, Kurds, they all went up north or overseas, or they got killed. Um, Saddam, in spite of all the problem uh, about him, he was an art lover and lover of literature. So he transferred a lot of ancient uh, documents from Baghdad into Mosul, which was his tribe, and kept in the Mosul library. But these people got in there and destroyed everything. That is Mosul library um, after they have been through that. So there is a word for this kind of thing. They call it biblioclasm. Burning of old books and artifacts. Uh, in India, for example, in 1100 something, the Turkish king came and there was a huge big university of that time called Nalanda University. They had nearly 9 million documents there. Everything was destroyed. And of course, the Abbasid library in Baghdad was burned by Hulad Khan before he was defeated by the Mahmud. And burning your books is not uncommon. If you look at uh, not so long ago, there was trouble in Sri Lanka. The reason was uh, there was a big library uh, in Jaffna in Sri Lanka. It, it had one of the very ancient Tamil documents. Tamil is a very ancient language. They had nearly a million documents in there. Somebody burned it down. That's why they had the trouble there, beginning of the trouble. That is Mosul Library again, which I've been around there. This is the Abbasid, Abbasid Library, which was burned down. Okay, now something about me. I worked in conflict zones as a humanitarian or otherwise quite a number of times. Uh, my experience, um, the first one was in 1971. Um, I did my anesthesia post-graduation in India in a city near the border with Pakistan called Amritsar. It's only 12 or 13 kilo, my, miles from there. The, the, there was an Indo-Pakistan war just around the time I was leaving. It was very short, but very traditional, old-fashioned war. You don't see that anymore. For example, I could see in my balcony there and watch the two air forces doing dog fighting, which you never see anymore because they can shoot from two couple of hundred miles away now. Belfast, I worked in Belfast for 10 years. That was a peak of the trouble in 40s and early 80s. And I worked with New Zealand Defense Forces three times in East Timor. We didn't have any fighting, but we looked after civilians. Then I was in multiple um, MSM or Medicines of Frontier missions. I was in Northern Pakistan, Afghan border. I was in Northern Nigeria where the there was trouble with uh, Boko Haram. I was in Yemen twice. And I was in Iraq three times. I was in Syria. All these troubles, areas were troubled areas. What is special for the medic in modern war zone? Most things are unexpected. Nothing is happens as you expected. Mass casualty, but you might be sitting there after it after a day of work, tired, tired after a day of work, then suddenly a big amount of number of people will come. 32 was the maximum, uh, the largest I got. Considering that there were only two of us, two surgeons and two anesthetists at the best, and just a couple of operating theaters, that is a big load. And use very destructive weapons, sharp knives, blasts, burns, controlled wounds, Hospital, uh, this, you always hear, the, I feel kind of, feel like laughing sometimes I hear that the hospital was destroyed. That's exactly what happens because one party make a base of the hospital and the other party bombs it. For example, ISIL made, uh, go into all these hospitals when they were desperately fighting the Americans. 
all those hospitals were destroyed by the F-16s. This is one of the best pediatric hospitals in Baghdad, in Mosul, just flattened. They call it collateral damage. Being a medic in boss owns, you need, they full of rumors, false news, need a bit, to, and of course you need a lot of courage and be prepared for it. Good to know if you know the local language, culture and customs. Uh, I knew I can talk multiple languages. Most of the languages around uh, um, India and uh, Northern India and extending into, um, into the Middle East, I can understand it. Uh, I know the culture because I grew up with a lot of Muslims. I know the customs. So I was lucky in one way. And especially if you look like one, for example, there are four photos of me, same old idiot in that, but one is in Iraq, one is in Yemen, one is in Afghanistan, one is at home. I look the same, but I look like a lot of the local people if I dress up. So that was an advantage. Now let's go on to the more thing. This is Mosul city. Um, if you look at the, if you remember the history of Mosul, that was occupied by ISIL. American Iraqi forces started pushing them out. And, and when I first reached there, they have just re, uh, got rid of them in the east part of the Mosul. The Tigris River is right in the middle, goes from north to south. So eastern part was liberated by the Americans. Uh, when I first reached there, first time I reached there. And the ISIL was on the Western Mosul. So uh, it was pretty dangerous kind of situation. War, active war is going on. So the, my mission, our mission was to set up a new hospital because all hospital and public buildings were occupied by Daesh or ISIL and the Iraqi bombs uh, and US bombs destroyed all of them. So there were no functioning public hospital when we reached there because in the short war they had before that, everything was destroyed. A lot of doctors went overseas, ran away, but those stayed, had to, uh, had to work and paid $1 a day. Considering that it was far from adequate to survive, a lot of doctors had to pay and depend on their relations or friends to support them. So our mission was to make this, convert the school into a hospital. It actually was somewhat dangerous because there was a army base, American uh, Iraqi base right behind the hospital and the artillery was going across every few minutes, the barrage of it over the hospital, uh, supposed to hospital into the other side, west side. And ISIL didn't have any weapons of any description. So they got all these drones from somewhere and, it, and they dropped things all around the place. Uh, they will come and drop it and run away because if they slow down looking for a good target, somebody will shoot it down because the army are all around the place. So in, in between managed to set up an AI department and OT and emergency wards, two of them, because you need men and women separate wards. Oh, this is actually McDonald's photo, but uh, this is how he basically did. They just drop things in various bags. Problem was no idea what it was being dropped, explosives or chemicals. Um, it was a pretty dangerous thing. We stayed uh, in Kurdistan, which is about 35 kilometers away and drove in every day because there was night curfew. We couldn't really get out anyway. So we kind of came every morning and went in the evening. We had to carry a body armor, bulletproof helmet, and this pack, which is the gas protection pack. It had face mask with filter decontamination solution, because they need to spread something if you're contaminated. 
sponge, dry swabs, normal saline for the eye. And this trip was quite interesting. That's the first and only time I heard somebody shaking your hand saying, good luck before you went to the hospital because people were a bit scared. None of us had any clear idea what was happening there. So essentially we concentrated on protecting staff and patients, diagnose if we can and care for the victims, even if you can't diagnose what it is. Most probably it was chlorine because if you look at it, you mix bleach and acid, it produces chlorine. So all that they had to do is in some container, mix them and send the drone away and drop it somewhere. So most of the people we saw had just irritable eye, swollen eye, uh, throat irritation. Some people had asthma-like thing, but they were okay. Assume it was only chlorine and nothing else because it all went away after a few hours. So by the time I left, Dash had been beaten in West Mosul. So, we had to do something for the people. So we had a shower. We need a shower to clean any gas cases, poison cases, you got to clean it, clean them up first. So we had a shower and oxygen concentrators with mask and bag. That's all what we had. <clears throat> Lucky it, we were okay. Now they have we have a, a they they have a better jacket to put on. Uh, but we didn't have that. You know, all that you have extra is actually atropine because if it is some sort of poison like sarin or something, atropine is useful as far as I understand. Now, something about tear gas. This photo I got from Sri recent Sri Lankan troubles. People were the protesters were tear gassed. Sounds interesting. Um, um, that is CS gas, that is the formula for it, whatever it is. Makes you cry and choke because I have, I have had a um, uh, situation of having to, having to, to, having, having to be there when this happened many times in, the, in my younger days. It really makes you, you cry and choke. And it's basically uh, every youngster when I was young, had this revolutionary tendency. They had to protest, whatever it is. Um, political activism was very part of student life in my time in India. Along with my colleagues, got tear gas quite a lot of times because we protested about myths of that in the school. And occasionally we got beaten by big long sticks called lathis. And a couple of times I got arrested, but everything was, even by evening, we, there was no record of anything. We all went home happily. Well, if you want to know, water is the first, the first aid treatment. Wash your eyes and run like hell. The reason was he was our hero. One of my bucket list was go and see his mausoleum in Santa Clara in Cuba. And one of his saying, if you tremble with indignation at every injustice, then you are a comrade of mine. And I kept to that. Uh, I think that I dedicate this talk to 58 brave men from Moscow and East Ari who died in the First World War. And my friend, Jim Robertson, who is a Second World War veteran I used to know a lot of them in Moscow, but they all kind of passed on. He's the only one I know now. So every week he's in a care home now, but I go and see him share an old dark and talk about the old days. And I mean, his, how brave we were they compared to the weak people in one way to face up to trouble and, and, and bold enough to go and face up to trouble, even though they find a few, but it never like the old days. People really volunteer to go for fight for their country in that time, but not anymore. 
Only a few dare to go. Ah, anybody got any questions or comments? You can email me on that or ask me now. Thank you. Okay, any questions? Maybe you can, are there any questions on that um, chat? Yes. No, there. no, that's fine. I don't need any questions. Matthew, you, you mentioned a, um, a a missionary group. Is that right? That you were associated with? Mission Sai Frontier, Doctors Without Borders. Oh, Doctors Without Borders. I see. Sorry, I should have mentioned it. Uh, MSF. MSF. Yeah. Right. It's basically. Uh, uh, a voluntary organization oh. uh, supposed to be very neutral. Uh, we go where there is trouble, they go. Uh -huh. They are there currently, for example, all over the world there is trouble. Right. It's a, it's a French word, obviously. Médecin. Yeah, it's a French. Frontier. They started in France and they, they, they are the headquarters there in Paris. So they are all over the world. Um, it's one of the largest voluntary organization doing work in conflict zone. My right. Doctors Without Borders is the English translation to it. And they won the Nobel Prize, a, few, a Peace Prize a few years ago. Uh, they've got a large number of staff, I think about yeah. 100,000 uh, 100, people working all around. Generally experts go and get the local volunteers to join in and establish camps. Usually experts go for about six to eight weeks. It is, can't work more than that continuously because 24 seven uh, and do everything your own, including uh, works which are not doctor's works. You do nurses work, orderly work, cleaning work. Are they, are they mostly people like you that have a, a, a regular day job, so to speak, and then go off for just a short period yeah, to, yeah. To, to volunteer. Yeah, um, I should thank my wife for not getting a holiday for seven years because I spend all my holidays going to these places. My, my and thanks to my colleagues, they kind of let me go, uh, and managers and and wife was particularly considerate. She never complained about not having a holiday. And where do you live when you go there? Do they provide you with some kind of yeah, they, they place provide, to live? They, it's reasonably safe there. They don't put you in the ditch. They look after you very carefully. Having said that, some people get bombed and uh, attacked and all, but that's very rare and very safe. Uh, and uh, there is no army security or anything, but uh, we go to an area where both sides agree that we can go. Um, that, so there is no chance getting attacked by one side, even though fighting all around us goes on. Oh. How do I cope with the emotional toll of working in conflict zones? Easy. I don't have any emotions. <laughs> I, I, I'm used to, the, as I said, I have got a lot of, a uh, lot of years I worked, worked in places where there are conflicts. For example, 10 years in Northern Ireland, we had a lot of shooting, a lot of bomb blasts. And I was an ordinary trainee there. Um, so it really, I mean, I, fear and emotional things are, you make your own fear and your own emotions. If you, if you learn to ignore it, then there is no problem. No, I can be in the middle of anything. Uh, probably it's a bad trait, but I'm not really scared of anything. That is honest. I don't, I'm not scared. I'm near death about a, a dozen times for various things like road accidents and plane crashes and drownings and heart attack and nothing seemed to have bothered me. 
It's just me, I think. Okay. Could you comment on the chemical weapons used in serial civil war? What for? Oh, they're supposed to be chlorine. That is the final uh, judgment. So, uh, and saving that, a lot of people dead due to uh, chlorine is a little difficult to believe, unless you put into a room or something, uh, because it's a very short acting, immediate effect thing. It could be other things which I don't know about. Okay. Other questions? Yeah. You shout out. Uh, given your statement of research, you can deal with the involvement. Yes. Need to be brave in the field. That's what they did. They slept on, they had protective gear quite important, and they were not scared. They just, oh, one story is that one night there was an attack in the trenches. Everything is higher than air, so it just drops down. They just slept through with their gear. One night they were caught up though, because after the attack, they decided to clean their equipments. And then they got a second attack the same night. They kind of caught a few of them, uh, their pants down, but, they were okay. Uh, what? I know, I want to hear that. Oh, oh, I have nothing to do with it. I have nothing to do. I was not in the army at all. I was with Mersan uh, de Frontier, and we were in. Uh, areas where the army was in army, New Zealand army was towards Baghdad. And we, uh, we were in Mosul and then a couple of times in a city called um, Koyara, which is adjacent to Mosul. Uh, no, nothing, no relation with any army at all. Only time I ever worked with the army was with the New Zealand Defense Forces as a civilian in East Timor. Yeah. Other questions? Okay. Huh? Okay, well, would everyone please join me in thanking Matthew for a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much, Mel.